Tigers. So Hedbranger's bull curled up with this particularly glamorous tiger in its natural environment. Closer till we get close together. Well, that's nice. Hold that there. Jay, come up a bit. That's better. Right, bit more action now. Keep it going. Now, many of the photographs you see here have actually ended up on the front cover of rock magazines and even some albums. This is Ray Palmer's photographic studios, and very shortly we'll be going on a mad rock and roll shopping spree in London with those young and crazy guys from British glam rockers Tiger Tales. But first, Headbanger's ball is going to clear a path through the makeup and hairspray and hopefully uncover the naked truth about their new album, Berserk. Could you explain why there was a two-year break between the Young and Crazy album and the new Berserk album? Right, well, I mean, obviously there was a lot of things like, I mean, number one, him. I mean, there's a different singer now. Uh, well, that's Steve's hair. He's dyed black. No, different singer. Um, when we got into the studio, there was a, a lot of problems, like with the producer. Had to fly off to Japan and do another band, so we took a month off for that. <laughs> um... I was involved in an accident, which I don't really want to go into, but was hospitalized for a while. And just basically all stuff like that, you know. And then waiting for the right time. I think a lot of people, man, were interested to see what the new album was going to be like. Because I think since the single Living Without You, since Young and Crazy, we had Kim, and then Love Bomb Baby, I think a lot of people got more interested when they, you know, and they wanted to hear more. Obviously, the production was a lot better on Love Bomb Baby. And I, and I think that's definitely a lot, you know, a lot to do. A lot of people checked it out and... We didn't get taken as much as silly as we used to, I think. Why did you place so much emphasis on the lavish packaging for the album? Uh, we wanted an album with the packaging matching up to what was on the vinyl, I think. Pepsi, could you explain what part Don Airy of Whitesnake played on the album? Yeah, well, we decided uh, initially that with any ideas that we had, we want to follow up. So if we wanted keyboards, we'd make sure there was keyboards on there, whatever, orchestra, whatever. And uh, we just figured um, Don Airy was like the archetypal rock keyboardist, if you like. So we just went about trying to get him, and luckily our producer knew him, rung him up, said, will you do it? And he said, yes. And uh, also, not only did he do keyboards for us, he also uh, scored the orchestra, conducted the orchestra. Just a generally all-round nice guy. If someone comes to the show or they listen to an album and they don't like it, that's fair enough. But if they, if they say they don't like it without even watching or listening or give it any time, then it does bother me, but, you know, it's entirely up to them, really. What we were saying earlier about the, the first album being raw, I think the new one still got the, the balls that we had originally, but I think we were just concentrating on writing good songs. So uh, I guess, I don't, I don't see it as being like a seller. We're just trying to write more immediate melodies and just trying to do what we do in a more sort of less, or a more or less, in a less roundabout way, just be much more direct and hard hitting about everything. So I think the melodies are more infectious and just everything's a lot tighter. The same old things though, really. I mean, it's always like poison or I'll never take all the makeup off and all that kind of thing. I mean, what's the point in doing it in the first place, you know? I mean, I saw a picture of C.C. DeVille today. I mean, my uncle looks better than he did. <laughs> he's 56, you know what I mean? So. Could you ever see yourself taking off the makeup and becoming a more serious band? I think the only reason we do that would be to try and get people to take us seriously, but I don't think they would even if we took all the makeup off, so I mean. It's, it's there to stay, I think. Plus, we're very, very, very ugly, so <laughs> it's going to have to hang around for a little while. OK, that's the serious side of things over and done with. Now we're going to go on a mad rock and roll shopping spree with the guys in London, and it may give us some insight as to how they put their image together. Ken's in the market. MTV's going to give us a shitload of money. Oh, we're going to spend cash? it all, man. We're going to spend it all on clothes, and we're going to look just as diabolical afterwards as we do now. I actually bought this here about two years ago. <laughs> it looked like that. So this is disgusting. Anyway, um, perhaps I should try one on. Maybe I'll look much better in that. I don't know. Maybe not. It's 190 quid. Definitely not. My grandmother probably like it. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Isn't that original? A Harley Davidson logo. 
But what you really want, of course, is a Tiger Tails T-shirt. But the back, the, actually, the, that's the front, and it's terrible, so you have to wear it backwards. Johnson's was established in 1968. It's one of the original stalls in the market. It's one of the two originals still left from when the market opened. It's originally in the far left-hand corner, just a tiny little stall, and it's expanded since then. It's the one of the only places, like I said, two that have actually lived through all the kind of the duff years in the 70s and everything. And we've had a couple of pop stars actually working here. Um, Billy Duffy drove a van for us and then worked in one of the shops. Uh, another one is Dave Parsons from Transvision Van, worked here for about five years. So we've, we've had a few even working for us. I'll sell you a couple of boots if you want. You got to go your size. Get your size. These, these are my, these are mine. What size are you? Are these? You know. I don't want you to go. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> Golfing shoes. Now that's the fellas I'm after. Now these, this, this particular kind of boot is, uh, is my kind of boot. The Johnson's boot. You know. Good quality. Just the three thousand pounds to buy. I'm only kidding, of course. These are really nice, actually. Not for me, but I'll stick to my Dr. Martens. The cool T-shirts. Thing is. They got sleeves on them, which is definitely a no-no in rock and roll, man. You gotta cut the sleeves off. I like this one, though. Hi, this is Clint Hooker here. Yeah? For some reason, I've been told today that I should be looking through the women's clothes, but being as I'm Mr. Hooker, I'll do whatever I like, so we won't do that. So, Kim, could you tell us how you achieved the effect of the red eyes that we see on the front of the album cover? Uh, it's something to do with hell. Something to do with hell, death, fire, blood, pain, and red contact lenses. Next. This goes for my manager. Man, what's this retail at? I gotta know. Whoops. Get out of here, boy! There's two essential items for any rock band. One is guitars, and one is pink hairspray. Welcome to Red Balls on Fire! House! buy a bracelet. Okay, Mark, could you tell us about some of the famous customers who buy clothes in the shop? Uh, everybody from Bon Jovi to Guns N' Roses. I have my list up there, Cher, or also other people like Taylor Dane or Depeche Mode, Kingdom Come, Almighty, and um, local bands too, like uh, Choir Boys. These night I was here from Twisted Sister. And uh, from Hanoi Rocks, Andy McCoy. Uh, nah. These ones right here, man, definitely these ones. And I gotta say, these ones, like I said, I got jacket and you go perfect with them. Leather trousers, definitely and chaps. And uh, the belts as well, but the leather trousers and the chaps. Joey Belladonna from Anthrax, shop chair, I believe. As did, as you've already heard, Slash, and as did Gene Simmons you'd care to look down there. Obviously the greatest bass player in the world and the true king. If you'd like to look up at me once more and if you care to look back down again, I'll give you a rendition of I want a rock and roll all night. Now, Headbangers Ball posed the all-important question. How many rock stars can you fit into a changing cubicle? <laughs>